The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. All right, let's worship our God together as we look at the Scriptures this morning. Uh, We've been preaching through the I Am statements of John here the last several weeks, and the elders have assigned me I Am the Door in John chapter 10. I have been very edified by this passage in my own study, and if I can convey a fraction of that to you, then I'll be very grateful. If I can do it in a fraction of the time I've spent preparing, you will be very grateful. (laughs) All right, let's seek the Lord together. Our Heavenly Father, we confess that this whole exercise of preaching is useless unless your Spirit attends us. It is your word, O Lord, and you've promised it will not return void. Father, I pray that you would give ability to me as I bring the word, that you would keep me from error. Pray that you would show us any sin in our hearts this morning and that you would lead us to the great joy which is in Jesus Christ. We ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen. It was 1945. My grandpa, Bill Chandler, was coming home from the war. He was a navigator on a B-29 aircraft. And they were, uh, final orders were to fly to a little place called Johnson Island, which being a mile wide was a veritable needle in the middle of the vast Pacific. Unfortunately, because it was late in the war, the airplane had some equipment that was not operative. The radio compass and the Loran navigation system were both non-functional. So they had to fly at night above the clouds, and Grandpa had to use the sextant to take measurements of the North Star on a regular basis. All night long, he plotted the course, he plotted the winds. As it came time, uh, when they should have arrived at the island, they descended below the clouds. It also had broken day, so they're no longer able to navigate by the stars. And the pilot, as they watched the fuel supplies dwindle in the aircraft, became uncertain as to where is the island. At one point, the pilot, based on previous experience with another navigator on other aircraft, um, said, well, I'm going to steer the aircraft to the left. I think maybe we've missed the course and we need to go off. And at that point, my grandpa Bill boldly said on the radio, if this airplane deviates from the course that I have plotted, I want you men to know that I am not responsible for all of your lives when we go into the drink. Now, as I heard the story from my grandpa years ago, there was almost a mutiny on board at that moment. Uh, But fortunately, soon after, the nose gunner spotted land. They were able to land, and as they received instructions from the control tower to taxi, my grandpa, or the pilot, radioed back, and and he said, unable to taxi, all engines stopped. They'd actually run out of fuel on the runway. There was no margin of error, right? It was a close brush with death. But my grandpa helped all the men and with him to find the true way home. And by God's grace, they all made it with a minute of fuel to spare. This morning, we're going to look at God's true way or door into the place where we belong, which is fellowship with him. So our text is John chapter 10, uh, but I was excited to discover in my preparation that John chapter 10 follows John chapter 9. Jesus' claim to be the door of the sheep is in the context of the healing of the blind man, which we just read in John chapter 9. And this is one of my favorite passages uh, in the Gospels. And if we look briefly at 1021, you'll see we know these are all part of the same scene because further down in chapter 10, it actually wraps up together. In 21, uh, or verses 20 and 21 of chapter 10, it says, Many of them were saying he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? So this is all part of the same scene where this blind man has been healed. And the the text that we're about to read here at the beginning of chapter 10 is one uh, that Jesus says, standing right in front of the Pharisees and the people that are all gathered around this blind man who has been healed. So let's read together John chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. 
But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We have a bit of a mixed metaphor um, in this passage because it starts talking about the shepherd, uh, but then switches to where Jesus says, I am the door. And there's actually a beautiful reason for this, and that was that in Near Eastern tradition, the shepherds or gatekeepers would often sleep in the door. They themselves were the door. They would sleep in the door in order to protect the sheep so that anyone that came in the middle of the night would have to first reckon with the shepherd. We'll see in the later half of chapter 10, but I won't be preaching that. Another man will. I believe Greg in a few weeks. I am the good shepherd. So the metaphors are mixed, and if I mix them up in my sermon a little bit, it's not my fault. It's here in the text. <laughs> All right? So we'll keep that in mind. Uh, but both protect the sheep. So that's one thing we can learn right away. So I want to look at this this morning in three major headings. Um, the, we're going to look first at the uniqueness of the door, then secondly, at distinctions of true and false shepherds, and thirdly, we'll look at the generous offer of the door. So first, the uniqueness of the door. What is this door, or better, who? The door is the true entrance to fellowship with God. The door pictured is not a particular church or a particular place, but the entrance to relationship with God in which we become his sheep and he becomes our shepherd. Jesus is both the door and the shepherd. Now, how many doors to God are there? This is door is singular. There's only one door in the text, and that's no accident. But in our day, we're taught, aren't we, that there are many doors to God, many ways. So I want to, and this is probably iconified uh, by that uh, ridiculous bumper sticker that's blue and white that says, Coexist. Right, that you've seen with all the religious symbols of the world on it. Cleverly, graphically, I'll admit it's clever, right? Uh, but cleverly arranged. There are many things I could say about that bumper sticker, uh, but it grieves me every time I see it because the subtle message of it is that all the religions of the world can co-redeem, right? And that is utter nonsense. Jesus does not admit any such nonsense here. He claims to be the door. And later, as another man will cover, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Even among God's true prophets of old, right, Jesus stands alone. Think about the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah were there, and Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. And what does the voice say that comes out of heaven? This is my beloved Son, here him. Jesus stands alone, even within the Judeo um, heritage that of the prophets. So the proponents of tolerance preach that we need to love everyone, and they're right, we do. But would it have been loving for my grandpa to acquiesce to the pilot when he wanted to steer off course? What if grandpa had said to the pilot, you know, you're probably right, there are many ways to Johnson Island. I'm sure if we all sincerely look for it, we'll find it soon enough. <laughs> no, love demands that if we know the way, we show the way. Is Jesus being boastful to make this claim that he is the door? Is he a megalomaniac? No, Jesus has the right to make this claim because he is unique in all of history. So I want us to consider briefly three reasons and just exalt a little bit, just rejoice in what 
our Jesus is. I have a very simple outline here. Jesus lived like no one else. Jesus died like no one else. And Jesus rose again like no one else. Jesus is the only one to have ever lived 100% selflessly. Think of his days of ministry, consumed with healing, the blind, deaf, dumb, mute, paralytics, demon-possessed people. Think of the relief of the parents when their children were healed of demons. He did miracles like no one had ever done before, even raised people from the dead. Who is this, the disciples asked, that even the wind and sea obey him? Even the fish in the sea obeyed him. And when Peter saw that, when the Lord sent all the fish into the nets so that they were so heavy they were breaking, what did Peter say? Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Jesus could turn fish into worship. What other religious leader has done that? Jesus died like no one else. He voluntarily gave his own life for his people. Led like a lamb, silent to the slaughter on the cruelest instrument of death in the Roman world. And in the midst of death, an unrighteous death brought about by self-righteous people and judicial mockery. Even amidst, amidst such injustice, what does he do? He asks the Father on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. No one has died like that. Who else has died in fulfillment of hundreds of specific prophecies from hundreds to thousands of years ago? Who else's death has brought darkness in the middle of the day, an earthquake, and opened graves? No one in history has died like him. And even the centurion, who was standing by, said, Truly, this was the Son of God. But that wasn't the end, was it? Jesus rose from the dead like no one else. He voluntarily gave his life, and he took it up again. And there was so much power in the resurrection that the eyewitnesses became changed men. Only three or four days before, they had been timid, fleeing the scene of the trial, fleeing the scene of the cross. And yet now, because they've seen the resurrection, what do they do? They preach boldly. They're willing to be beaten, imprisoned, and eventually every one of them gives their lives for the Lord Jesus. So great is the power of the resurrection that even today, men who have tried to disprove it and have gone and studied and gone and been archaeologists, looked at all the historical records, tried to disprove the resurrection, some of those men have actually been converted by it because Jesus is still on the throne and he is alive and he still has power over this world. Jesus is the only one who has dealt with the problem of sin, the only one who satisfied divine justice by the sacrifice of his own life. No other religious founder made such claims. And no other religion has a satisfactory answer to sin. Jesus tells us that he is the one and only door to God. And the apostles who witnessed all these things are no less exclusive. There is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Apparently the apostle Paul didn't have a coexist bumper sticker either. (laughs) Jesus is the singular door to fellowship with God. His life, death, and resurrection declared that he alone is worthy to make such a claim. Now, a door provides entrance, but a door also keeps out. It keeps out enemies, thieves, and predators. So we want to look here at, in the context, some distinctions of true and false shepherds. In verse 8 of chapter 10, Jesus says, All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So who is he referring to? Who are these that came before him that he calls thieves and robbers? Is he referring to Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist? No, I don't think so. I think he's referring to the Pharisees who are standing right in front of him. They're all part of this scene. Zechariah the prophet prophesied about these false shepherds to come in the time of Christ. In Zechariah 11.8, we read, Then I annihilated the three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them, and their soul also was weary of me. Later in that same chapter in Zechariah, we have the prophecy that Jesus would be sold for 30 pieces of silver and the money used to buy the potter's field, exactly as it's recorded that happened. So we know that this passage relates to the time of Christ. 
But who are the three shepherds? Well, many commentators believe it refers to the three schools of Jewish thought at the time of Christ, which were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And of those three, the Pharisees are recorded as being present here in our scene. So who were the Pharisees? They were religious teachers and they were lawyers. Of the three prominent schools, they were the theological conservatives. They held to original intent of the Torah's authors and also to their own oral traditions, which interpreted the law. For the Pharisee, religion was primarily about the Mosaic law and particularly its external regulations. So they were the kind of men who always drove the speed limit and collected all their receipts from purchases out of state on the internet and paid sales tax on them in their home state. They sought to follow God's law exactly. And that was good. They wanted everyone around them to know it. Not good. They wanted everyone to hear their long prayers and to see how much they put in the offering box. But they were mainly concerned with right practice, not a right spirit. Well, I want us to understand this morning the Pharisees correctly. Pharisee is not a synonym for hypocrite. Right? And if you've grown up in the church, that's the way we're used to thinking of the Pharisees because Jesus called them hypocrites. But there was a school of religious thought, and if we demonize and dismiss them, then we may well repeat their mistakes. The Pharisees aimed to be faithful to God and zealous for him. They thought they were pleasing God by being careful disciples of Moses. We get some insight from uh, one of the most famous Pharisees, a man named Saul who gives his own credentials as a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. In the mind of the faithful Jew, these were all good things. When Jesus said, the time comes when he who kills you thinks that he does God's service, he may well have been referring to Pharisees like Saul. They thought they were doing God's will. But they had two blind spots, didn't they? Mercy and humility. When this miraculous healing took place, was their first thought? Praise God, we live in times of visitation by a prophet. Could this be the Messiah? Was their first thought, praise God for his kindness to this poor blind man and he's healed him so he no longer has to beg. No, their first thought was, did someone say Jesus just healed another man on the Sabbath? Micah 6, 8 says, And what does the Lord require of you, O man, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The Pharisees, you see, stopped at to do justice. So in the context, it seems likely that those who came before me, the thieves and robbers, are indeed these Pharisees with whom he's talking. With them in mind, then, let's look at three characteristics of false shepherds in chapter 10. Uh, but the lessons are not restricted to teachers or shepherds, we have much to learn from them also. And these three characteristics we're going to consider are that false shepherds are self-righteous, false shepherds are self-appointed, and false shepherds are self-serving. All right, first, false shepherds are self-righteous. What is self-righteousness? Well, a simple or technical definition might just be believing that you are right before God because you keep his law. But there is an additional element as we commonly use the word, and that is pride, isn't it? The Pharisees certainly demonstrated this. So a more complete definition might be having or characterized by a certainty, especially an unfounded one, that one is totally correct and or morally superior. So to see this, let's detour to our context in chapter 9. And I've outlined the second half of this chapter in five Ds. These Ds represent the results of self-righteousness and we'll also come ultimately to see the remedy. So let's read back in chapter 9, verses 18 through 23. The Jews did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son? who you say was born blind. Here's a little insult there. Who you say was born blind, as if they wouldn't know whether he was born blind. Then how does he now see? 
His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, or who opened his eyes we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So the first D is drama. People had been talking. This strange thing has occurred. This man has been healed, but it happened on the Sabbath. And so some of the people say, well, Jesus couldn't be of God because he wouldn't work on the Sabbath. Others said, well, he has to be of God because he couldn't heal the man if he weren't of God. So the Pharisees' shocking conclusion is that the man is lying, that he hasn't, he hasn't actually been healed. He never was blind. That's what they believe. And so they insist that they call his parents. So now his parents are bought into this. More drama, right? And his parents are afraid of the Jews. Why all the drama? The Pharisees have an extreme mental conflict. It seems as though a miracle has just occurred and therefore must be of God, but it occurred on the Sabbath and therefore must not be of God. Actually, there is one other possibility, and that is, of course, that they had misunderstood the Sabbath but they couldn't bring themselves to believe that they were wrong about that. Had it not been for their pride, they might have come to understand the whole law as Jesus taught it and not as they interpreted Moses. But without a teachable spirit, they could never obtain that blessing. So self-righteousness produces drama, conflict. Now I travel a lot for work and I sit in cafes and restaurants a lot. And as I look around, uh, sometimes I think I can see self-righteousness in the room. It's very easy to spot. People are scrunching up their face with an angry expression. They're pointing their fingers like this. And the things I overhear are, are language like this. As if he had any right. How dare she? Who does he think he is? The implication is that I or my party or my people would never do anything like that. When we hear this kind of language coming from our own hearts, regardless of whether we ever verbalize it, a red flag should go up. That's the language of the Pharisees. The second D is distortion. Self-righteousness distorted their perception of reality. Let's read verses 24 to 34 as we continue the story. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He then answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? There's a reason that I like this passage. <laughs> they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him out. Self-righteousness distorted their perception of reality. In verse 24, they tell him, Give God the glory. But the irony was, the man already was giving God the glory. He had already said, Jesus is a prophet. Worse, they saw the man's declaration as further proof that he must be a sinner because he was Jesus' disciple. Verse 34, you were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? In other words, how dare you? Recognize that language? They sincerely believed that they were right, but they were wrong about the blind man wrong about the Sabbath, wrong about Jesus, and wrong about themselves. But they could not see it. And this is the scary part for us, brothers. We say, how could they have been so deceived? 
The answer is because they kept God's law outwardly. Remember Paul, describing himself as Saul, said, with regard to the law, faultless. They kept it outwardly, and that fed their pride. So self-righteousness is pernicious because it doesn't afflict outwardly wicked people. It, ref it afflicts me and you, those of us in the church, leaders. We're the most likely to have to deal with this in our own hearts. How does it happen to us today? I think it often starts with strong convictions. Convictions are not a bad thing, right? They're a good thing. But one man has said there is a short trip between convictions and self-righteousness. And the trouble is, hardly anyone remembers making the trip. Convictions aren't wrong, but to disdain others who don't hold our convictions, that is a problem. That's an indicator of self-righteousness, right? It's about attitude. So if you're tracking with me, let me just give you a test. Think of someone who needs to be warned against self-righteousness. Don't say it out loud. Now, if the first person you thought of was not yourself, you're missing the point. The Lord knows how many times I have failed this test while listening to sermons. The truth is, brothers, you only know me for the last four and a half years. But if you had known me 20, 25 years ago, you would know that I would have made a very good Pharisee. I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. And he's not finished. I trust that. The third D is dismissal. They reviled him. What does that mean, kids? It means to make fun of, to, to condemn him, to make derogatory statements about him. Who are you? You're a sinner. Someone said dis. Yes, okay, thank you for the vocabulary of the, <laughs> the 2000s. They reviled him and they put him out. So they cast him out of the synagogue. The Pharisees are confronted with the reality that the miracle did occur, but it's impossible for them to believe still, so they now make it the poor blind man's fault. They revile him and put him out. Self-righteousness causes us to dismiss others. Have you ever dismissed anyone? Have you ever said, I'm done with him? Why should I bother talking with them anymore? I once heard a pastor say of another pastor, I can't stand to listen to anything he preaches. That did not end well. This tendency to dismiss others is why we need to be careful not to demonize or dismiss the Pharisees. See, because that's what Pharisees do. They dismiss. So if we do that, then we're effectively saying that we are morally superior to the Pharisees. And what is that? Same thing. See the problem? And this is why it's so difficult to address pride and self-righteousness, even as um, believers. I so appreciated Amanda's testimony last week at her baptism that before she was converted, that she was proud of her apologetics ability, but she did not love others. Right? Thank you for sharing that with us, Amanda, because that's a beautiful testimony of exactly what pride does. It inhibits our love for others, for fellow forgiven sinners. And one way we express that is dismissal. If I can just share something with you, brothers. At a previous church, I once felt I had been publicly slighted by one of the pastors. The pastor apologized and said it was unintentional, but I didn't believe the explanation that he gave. A spirit of bitterness grew and distance, and I eventually dismissed him in my mind. This ultimately placed me in a very difficult situation in a foreign country with no spiritual support or encouragement and I fell into the worst depression of my life. I would walk out onto the sidewalk which where we lived was sunny every day and 70 degrees and I was miserable. So I called a biblical counselor friend of mine, told him my, my situation, what do I do? He says, well, tell me the story. And so I started to tell him the story and I got to the point where I told him that this man had slighted me and he apologized and I didn't believe him. Brothers, I tear up every time I say this. Mike said to me, brother, tell me what's wrong with that. The Holy Spirit did the fastest heart surgery on record 
1 Corinthians 13 came to mind. Love believes all things. I had not believed the best concerning my brother. We rejoice together because I cannot change other people. But when God enables me to see my own sin, I know what to do with it. Take it to him, confess it, and receive forgiveness of, of the Lord. That's what I did. I confessed the sin to uh, this pastor as soon as I could, which was not easy. And I confessed it to the Lord. And as soon as I confessed it to the Lord, there was light in my heart. And I walked out of my apartment the next morning with a light in my heart and a light in my step that had not been there for months. So the reason I'm teaching these things this morning and spending so much time on this is because I've lived this and I don't want you to go through the same pain. I want you to enjoy God and his presence and a sweet spirit of humility. And when you do fall, to be able to go to him, confess it, and be forgiven. Let's be careful not to dismiss each other. If we continue in that path, it leads to, fourthly, destruction. Let's skip down to verses 40 and 41. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? See, the Pharisees had been, uh, they're starting to catch on to Jesus. I think maybe he's talking about us here. (laughs) I can't really put my finger on it. Well, they were right. So Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. This is a terrible pronunciation of judgment. Because you say we see, believing themselves to be righteous, their sin remains. Self-righteousness is like the ring of power in the Lord of the Rings. Right? What does Gollum call it, that hideous creature? My precious. The more you try to protect yourself and self-righteousness and keep it and cherish it, the more power it has to destroy you. It destroyed the Pharisees. In the name of doing right, they became merciless. And in the end, in order to protect their own righteousness, they crucified an innocent man. Jesus told them that in the day of judgment, the judgment of Jerusalem would be more severe than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. But, praise God, there is another alternative for self-righteous people, and that is, fifthly, deliverance. And we see that also right here. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. So what does it mean to be blind? In this context, as Jesus is using the word, it means if you apprehend your spiritual blindness, if you apprehend that you are unrighteousness, that you confess it and repent and ask his forgiveness, then he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Steve Brown of Reformed Theological Seminary said, when we finally acknowledge our need for forgiveness and come to God in repentance, we find true power. For now we have nothing to hide or protect. We don't care what others think about us or say about us. We are willing to speak truth gently and we are enabled to speak it with tremendous supernatural power. Someone else has said a Christian is someone with nothing to fear nothing to lose, and nothing to prove. There is deliverance. Let's go up into chapter 10 now and look at our door again. There are two more points about the false shepherds that I will read very quickly. That is just that they're self-appointed and self-serving. So self-appointed, if we read verses 1 to 3 again. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but comes up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The Pharisees had not come in through the door. They were the religious leaders of God's covenant people, but they completely missed the Messiah. So in that sense, they were self-appointed. By contrast, a true under-shepherd or pastor submits to Jesus and points to Jesus. You will hear him speak of his own sin and of the glory of the Savior. 
He will speak to you as a brother and a fellow sheep, not as a superior or higher caste, like the Pharisees did. On the other hand, if you see someone drawing attention to himself, like Diotrephes in the book of John, he has not come in through the door. If you see someone living in rebellion against Christ's commandments, he has not come in through the door. Instead, we are to follow those who imitate the great shepherd. False shepherds are self-serving. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, says verse 10. Now, who is the thief concerned about? Himself. Ezekiel, long before, pronounced judgment against these false shepherds of Israel. In Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 3, he says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Instead of feeding the flock, the false shepherds were serving themselves and destroying the sheep. The Pharisees elsewhere in the Gospels, we know, devoured widows' houses. How did they do that? Probably through the offering box. In the early church, there were men like Diotrephes and the men, the false teachers of Jude, who Jude says cared only for themselves. And sadly, this is present in every age in the church, isn't it? Maybe you have heard a story about an older wood widow who gave her life savings to a TV preacher, believing that she would receive a hundredfold because of that preacher's preaching. And all it did was to enrich the TV preacher at her expense. Like Hophni and Phinehas, the false shepherds feed themselves and not the flock. Those were the sons of Eli in the Old Testament who took the best part of the sacrifice meat for themselves. But in contrast to this, verse 4 gives us a precious insight about true shepherding. It says, When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Unlike modern shepherds who use uh, ATVs and sheepdogs to herd the sheep from behind, in the Near East, the shepherd would call them from the front. So they would keep all the sheep of many shepherds together in a pen overnight for safety. And then the shepherd would come and each man would call out to his own sheep and his sheep recognized his voice and so they would gather around the shepherd. And it's a beautiful picture of what Jesus does. He always leads from the front. There's nothing that Jesus asks us to do which Jesus has not already done. He lived the ultimate selfless life and calls us to do the same. And true spiritual leadership in the New Testament is always by example. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We come now to the third major heading, the generous offer of the door. So we've considered that false shepherds are self-righteous, self-appointed, self-serving. Self will not fit through the door. But let's look at the tenderness of Jesus, the door shepherd. He calls his sheep by name first. To him the doorkeeper opens, verse 3, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. If Jesus is your shepherd, if you have come to that door, then there is only one thing that matters, and that is his voice. He will lead you, protect you, and care for you. He knows your name and calls you by name. And not only your name, but your personality, your strengths and weaknesses. He made you. He knows your parents, your coworkers, your history. In fact, there's nothing about who you are or where you've been that Jesus hasn't brought and brought for your good. What does it matter what others think of you? If Jesus is your shepherd, God himself is pleased with you because he accepts the righteousness of Christ on your behalf. If our gracious and holy and all-powerful God is pleased with us, does it actually matter what anyone 
thinks of us? If God is for us, who can be against us? We have to wrestle with this all the time, don't we? It's much, much easier to say than to do. Right? For example, if you're going to preach a sermon, you might think things like, totally hypothetical, will attendance at Southside suddenly go from 300 to 30? <laughs> right? Will I ever be asked to preach again? What will the elders think? What will the people think? Right? What is all that? That's the fear of man. It's what does everybody think? Brothers, I'm here to tell you, I believe what I'm preaching. It doesn't matter. What the Lord thinks is what is most important. If he is pleased, if I proclaim his word faithfully, that's all that matters, right? That's my intent this morning. But this is hard work in our spirits. It does not come easy. There's a tremendous comfort that comes and a tremendous rest to the soul when you know that an all-powerful shepherd is for you. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Secondly, Jesus here promises to give these sheep abundant life. In verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. What does a sheep really need? Protection and pasture. Those are abundant life to a sheep. If it's a sunny day or maybe even a cool one because of the wool, and there's plenty of grass to eat and quiet flowing waters and no stress. It's a happy day in Sheepville. Right? That is abundant life. So these metaphors are beautiful. They express a reality that is honestly hard to describe. It's possible to experience, but it's hard to describe. So let me try to make it just a little more concrete for us. Sorry, on that last page, my notes just disappeared. <laughs> and you know what? That's okay. Because the last part of this is where I wanted to speak to you from the heart as much directly as possible. How can I make this concrete? Is there drama? Is there distortion? Is there dismissal in your life? Jesus can heal you from those things. I know this because I have experienced it myself. God has done this for me. And I know it's your testimony. Many of you who are here, some of you I've heard your testimonies. Twenty-some years ago, I thought that I was irreparably broken. There was some warp, some bent in my personality. There is, by the way. <laughs> and that it just distorted everything I did and that I could never be healed. I was very needy, always needing affection from others. I could not function without it, really. And I, I just, there were so many weird desires and thoughts, I just thought I'm broken, right? I'm going to have to try to find some counselor who can help me, some pastor, some formula, some magic thing. But I read two books which changed my life. One was uh, called Pleasing People by Lou Priolo. It helped me to see the fear of man in my heart. That's a lot related to this self-righteousness that we see here, right? And the other one, even more precious, I think, was The Sufficiency of Christ, I believe, by MacArthur. And in that book, what I saw was that I have a good shepherd and that he loves me and that he cares for me. He knows my name. He knows my personality. He knows my warps. He knows my bent. He knows what's wrong with me. And if in his good time he wants to help me with those things, he has the power to fix it. 
and he will fix it. And he has fixed it. He is healing me. I am not where I will be, but I've made progress. But if he doesn't, if he wants to leave me broken and warped, I will trust him for that because he is my good shepherd. Right? I came to see him as the best master, the only one worthy of serving in the whole universe. And unlike human masters, unlike human shepherds, which may occasionally fail us, Jesus never fails us. He is with us always. He will never forsake us. The great promise that we find here that's in this beautiful metaphor, it is real. If you confess your sin, if you go to the Lord, the Lord will heal you of these things and he can give you abundant life. That's the precious promise that we have in this passage. If I can give you just two practical tips as we close here, as we struggle against self-righteousness and pride, because it's never done. It's never done. One is to pray for humility. I still remember the first time, as a naive young Christian, I told a pastor that I wanted to pray for humility. And he looked at me and he said, are you sure you want to do that? And I said, well, yes, why? And he says, because God will answer it. <laughs> and indeed, we know that. That's the testimony of our lives, isn't it? That he does answer it, and sometimes not exactly in the ways that we would like. And the second thing that I can recommend to you is to practice gratitude. Be thankful to the Lord for all the things in your life, whether it's health or sickness, whether it's your family, your friend, your good coworkers, your bad coworkers, People you love, difficult people, be thankful. The Lord has brought all those things, all for your good, all for his purpose. And be thankful to others as well. The more we thank each other for the things that we do for each other, I think the less inclined we are to have a very high view of ourselves. Right? Self-gratitude is the enemy of self-righteousness. Well, let's thank the Lord for this time together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in your word. Thank you for giving us grace. Thank you for Jesus, our good shepherd. Thank you that we can trust him, that we can have confidence in him, that you will heal us, Lord, and give us life abundant. We pray, Father, that you would help us to become more like Christ as we imitate him. We pray that you would bless us now as we go. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.